everyone. I am Camille McGirt and I'm a senior studying health policy and management in the School of Public Health and I would like to thank the Carolina Black Caucus for allowing me to come and Camille Brooks for inviting me to speak or well to uh, recite this uh, excerpt from Martin Luther King's What is Your Life's Blueprint speech. Um, six, be six months before he was assassinated he spoke to a group of students at Barat Junior High School uh, in Philadelphia on October 26. 1967 and he asked them what is your life's blueprint and I'm going to read uh, some parts of that speech I want to ask you a question and that is what is your life's blueprint whenever a building is constructed you have an architect who draws a blueprint and that blueprint serves as a pattern as the guide and the building is not well erected without a good solid blueprint now each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives and the question is whether you have a proper a solid and a sound blueprint I want to suggest some of the things that should begin your life's blueprint Number one in your life's blueprint should be the deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are a nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as the basic principle the, ter the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days, as the years unfold, what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. Set out to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, doors are opening to you doors and opportunities that were not open to your mothers and your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready as, the, as these doors open. I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. I understand all the sociological reasons, but I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation you're forced to live in, stay in school. And when you discover what you will be in life, set out as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living dead or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the heaven, all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. And if you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. If you can't be a bush, be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by the size that you win or fail. Be the best at whatever you are. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm gonna read two poems today that are by Maya Angelou. The first poem I'm gonna read is called Life Doesn't Frighten Me. Shadows on the wall, noises down the hall. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Bad dogs barking loud, big ghosts in a cloud. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Mean old mother goose, lions on the loose. They don't frighten me at all. Dragons breathing flame on my counterpane. That doesn't frighten me at all. I go boo. I make make them shoot. I'm fun way they run. I won't cry so they fly. I just smile. They go wild. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Tough guys in a fight, all alone, at night. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Panthers in the park, strangers in the dark. No, they don't frighten me at all. That new classroom will boys pull my hair. Kissy little girls, with their hair and curls. They don't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my scream. If I'm afraid at all, it's only in my dreams. I've got a magic charm, I keep up my sleeve. I can walk on the ocean floor and never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Not at all, not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. By my Angel. Then this next poem I'm gonna read is called Still I Rise by Maya Angelou too. When my mom first showed me this poem, I barely, I didn't understand a word. But then when my dad got back from work and he explained it to me, I understood everything. <laughs> Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may, you may trod me in the very dirt but still, like air, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. <laughs> just like moons and just like suns, of the certainty with the certainty of the tides. Just like so hopes springing high, still. I'll rise. Do you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes. Shad shoulders following, following like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't take it awful hard. Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines sticking in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come with surprise? <laughs> Did I dance like I've got diamonds at the meetings of my thighs? <laughs> Out of the huts of sh history's shame, I rise up from the path that's rooted me in pain. I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise.
into a daybreak that is wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of a slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. everybody. Yes, my name is Mima and I'm 12 years old and I'm going to be reading a poem called Who Am I? Who Are We? Sometimes I wonder who I am. I learned that I took a trip across the waves and that my ancestors were brought to America as slaves. But something deep inside of me tells me that there must be more. I understand the strength slavery gave us, but I knew our greatness began before. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? We are the builders of the Egyptian pyramids. You are the children of Narmer, the ruler of the first dynasty of Egypt. I am the child of Louis Latimer, who invented the first electric lamp. Alexander Miles, who built the first elevator, and Garrett Morgan, who invented the first traffic signal. I am the child of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, leaders who influenced our nation. I am the child of my parents who continue to shape me into an important part of our history. I am the foundation of our next generation. We are the ever-blossoming seeds of a race of strong rulers, builders, scientists, discoverers, teachers, leaders, dreamers, speakers, and achievers. I am the next generation. We are the future. And I must say that I take pride in that because that was one of the poems that I wrote. So thank you very much, Reba.
Good evening, everyone. Camille has set the bar way too high for me this evening. But I would like to offer a reading this evening from Vashti McKenzie. And um, Vashti McKenzie is the first woman elected to serve as bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And I'll read from her book titled Journey to the Well. And in this book, she uses as a foundation the story of the Samaritan woman who um, was changed or transformed after her encounter with Jesus at the well. So this comes from her book in chapter six, an excerpt from cha chapter six titled, A Woman Overcomes Learned Ignorance. When my husband and I moved into an attached home several years ago, a few shade trees and lots of grass surrounded it. Grass that needed to be cut. Stan purchased a state-of-the-art gas lawnmower with a grass catcher on the side. It was a beautiful green machine that purred when it started. In early spring, the grass grew like tall weeds. My husband intended to teach me how to use his green machine so I could help him with the grass cutting chores. I made it clear that I did, I did not want to learn how to work his green machine, where to put the gasoline, or how to empty the clippings. Why? I wanted to remain ignorant about cutting grass with the power mower because I didn't ever want to be asked to do such a thing. I could have learned or I could have leaned on learned ignorance and practiced learned helplessness for the rest of my life. Eventually, however, I rose above my laziness, stubbornness, and dodging my grass cutting responsibilities. Now, in the absence of teenagers and husband, I can be pressed into service if necessary. The Samaritan woman couldn't or wouldn't see that maybe there was a way out of the lifestyle she had come to know all too well. Five failed marriages, a frowned upon current relationship gave her something to hide out about. Still, she did have one hope that one day things would change and she kept going to the well to fetch water. She may have felt down, she may have felt angry or ashamed, but she got up and went to the well. She took a risk and spoke to Jesus, and that changed everything. She went from being a woman carrying an empty vessel, a woman whose life was mired in failure and isolation, to becoming a woman of belief, of action, of value. She became herself a vessel filled and overflowing with good news. Oftentimes, like the woman at the well, we are programmed to believe we can or cannot do something. In this chapter, we see that the Samaritan woman learns that she has been responding to her programmed expectations about life and that in order for things to one day change, she must risk, she must risk the challenge of changing herself. We all have the option of holding on to the learned ignorance in our lives, whether we believe we can't possibly balance a checkbook, run a mile, write a resume, or help a child with her math problems, or we, can, or we have the option of taking the risk to change our behavior and fulfill the potential of our lives. We have choices to make, informed choices. Ignorance is not bliss. Rise up beyond ignorance and become a well woman. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I've been called many things, some that can't be repeated, but not before Madam Queen. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening, I want to read from a book called Warriors Don't Cry by Melba Patillo Beals. And it's her 
rather compelling and distressing account of her first day in 1957 when she and eight other high school, black high school students integrated Central High School. So I'm going to read from the author's note and then a brief excerpt from chapter 10. This book was written in 1994, so it's already more than, well, almost 20 years old, but um, we can never forget. So, from the author's note, some people call me a heroine because I was one of nine black teenagers who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. At the age of 15, I faced angry mobs, violent enough to compel President Eisenhower to send combat-ready 101st Airborne soldiers to quell the violence. I endured a year of school days filled with events unlike any others in the history of this country. Although this happened over 35 years ago, again this was written in 94, I remember being inside Central High School as though it were yesterday. Memories leap out in a heartbeat, summoned by the sound of a helicopter, the wrath in a shouting voice, or the expression on a scowling face. From the beginning, I kept a diary, and my mother, Dr. Lois Patillo, a high school English teacher, kept copious notes and clipped a sea of newspaper articles. I began the first draft of this book when I was 18, but in the ensuing years, I could not face the ghosts that its pages called up. During intervals of renewed strength and commitment, I would find myself compelled to return to the manuscript only to have the pain of reliving my past undo my good intentions. Now, enough time has elapsed to allow healing to take place, enabling me to tell my story without bitterness. In some instances, I've changed people's names to protect their identities, but all the incidents recounted here are based on the diary I kept on news clippings, and on the recollections of my family and myself. While some of the conversations have been recreated, the story is accurate and conveys my truth of what it was like to live in the midst of a civil rights firestorm. And so a brief excerpt from chapter 10, when she first showed up at the school and went into the classroom. And she writes, <clears throat> As I entered the classroom, a hush fell over the students. The guide pointed me to an empty seat, and I walked toward it. Students sitting nearby quickly gathered their books and moved away. I sat down, surrounded by empty seats, feeling unbearably self-conscious. Still, I was relieved to be off my feet. I was disoriented, as though my world were blurred and leaning to the left, like a photograph snapped from a twisted angle and out of focus. A middle-aged woman, who I assumed to be the teacher, ignored me. Open your book to page 12, she said, without allowing her eyes to acknowledge me. Are you going to let that nigger coon sit in our class? A boy shouted as he glared at me. I waited for the teacher to say or do something. Now, class, if you're done the homework, then you know a loud voice cut her off, shouting. We can kick the crap out of this nigger, the heckler continued. Look, it's 20 of us, and only one of her. They ain't nothing but animals. Again, I waited for the teacher to speak up, but she said nothing. Some of the students snickered. The boy, he took his seat, but he kept shouting ugly words at me throughout the rest of the class. My heart was weeping, but I squeezed back the tears. I squared my shoulders and tried to remember what grandma had said. God loves you, child. No matter what, he sees you as his precious idea. Walking the gauntlet to my next class was even more harrowing. I had to go out behind the school, through the girls' dressing room, down a long concrete walkway, and onto the playing field. You'd better watch yourself, the guide warned as we moved at high speed through the hostile students. As we went outside to the walkway in the back of the school, I could hear the roar of the crowd in front of the school. It was even more deafening than the jeers immediately around me. On the playing field, a group of girls were gathered tossing a volleyball. The teacher appeared to be a no-nonsense person. With a pleasant smile, she pointed me to a spot near the net and warned the other girls not to bother me. 
Let's keep the game going, girls, she said in a matter-of-fact way. The girls paused for a moment, looked at each other, looked at me, and then began tossing the ball back and forth. For just one instant, I was actually concerned about whether or not I could hit the ball and score. It took me a moment to realize, though, that it was whizzling, whizzing awfully close to my head. I ducked, but they hit me real hard, shouting and cheering as they found their target. And even as I was struggling to escape their cruelty, I was at the same time more terrified by the sound of the angry crowd in the distance. It must be enormous, I thought. How would the police keep them back? Get inside, Melbourne, now! The face of the gym teacher showed both compassion and alarm as she quietly pointed to a group of women some distance away, jumping over the rear fence as they shouted obscenities at me. Hurry! I started to run for my life. Nigger, nigger, one woman cried, hot on my heels. Get the nigger. Three of them had broken away from the pack and were gaining on me. I was running at top speed when someone struck out a foot, stuck out a foot, and tripped me. I fell face forward, cutting my knee and my elbow. Several girls moved closer, and for an instant, I hoped they were drawing near to extend a hand and ask me if I needed help. The nigger is down, one shouted. She's bleeding. What do you know? Niggas bleed red blood. Let's kick the nigger. I saw the foot come in my way and grabbed it before it got to my face. I twisted it at the ankle like I'd seen them do in a wrestling match. The girl fell backwards. As I scrambled to my feet, I looked back to see the brigade of attacking mothers within striking distance, shouting about how they weren't going to have me in school with their kids. I ran up the stairs, hoping I could find my way back to the office. With the mothers close on my heels, shouting their threats, the twisted maze of the hallway seemed even more menacing. I felt I could have gotten lost forever as I struggled to find the door that led to the office, to safety, opening first one, then another. I raced through a honeycomb of locker rooms and dead-end hallways. After several minutes of opening the wrong doors and bumping into people who hit me and called me names, I was in tears, ready to give up, paralyzed by my fear. Suddenly, Grandma's voice came into my head. God never loses one of his flock. Shepherd, show me how to go, I said. I stood still and repeated those words over and over again. Shepherd, show me how to go until I gained some composure. I wiped my eyes and then I saw blood running down my leg and onto my saddle shoe. It was too much. I pressed my thumb to the wounded area to try to stop the bleeding. I've been looking for you. The stocky guide's voice was angry, but I was glad to see her. I almost forgot myself and reached to hug her. And just where do you think you are going? You are only supposed to travel through the school with me. She looked at my leg, but said nothing, then looked away. Thank you. Good evening. Um, as she said before, my name is uh, Matthew Taylor. I'm a sophomore student and I'm a spoken word artist. Uh, so I'll be performing an original piece I wrote entitled um, Master Controller. It was inspired by hip hop. And that is a music form that has its own criticisms oftentimes. But with this piece, I want you to know for certain that it is definitely an art form that is rooted in African-American culture. The documentary of my life given, it was written. I set my foundation on hip hop's pillars, examining the spray painted text that covered the struggles of young brothers who only knew the feel of a beat, of the drum from the sun, riding crops, clubs from cops, till it rang in their skulls and filled their heads with a sound that left them with a sensation until they met with the earth. Lights from overhead flashed and the vision was had. Slaves would jump as high as they could, held to the end of their chains, to show their strength to the one who'd owned them thereafter. Now we wear links of gold that swing loose around our necks and dance with wild movements to signify that we're free. 
No longer dance, no longer singing in the fields to let others know that master was coming. We vent heat like furnace fire and make blacks to whites to buyers. The term MC means master controller. Our bondage has passed. And though the sounds of 808 still resonate our people's heartbreaks, as the DJs spin our tails, we find wealth through record sales. Consider me a modern day griot. This is the epic I voice. What a mockery of slavery we've made for ourselves, owning fancy clothes to establish our wealth. Catch me swagging hard, rocking polos with the slacks, laughing at the fact the horsemen used to brand our backs. They used to hunt us in our tracks, and now they're hunting for our tracks. On our color, they want spat, but now these folks want to be black. You want me to jump on the stage? Show me a mic. And the back of this bus better have champagne if I'm touring. I'll pull up the drive through if you can see the car better. And the only cotton that I'm picking is from a sweater. They coined my ancestors a nigga. Please, I can never be another naive individual, glorifying greed, encouraging racism. Nah, quote me as never ignorant, getting goals accomplished. Put that on crit and pop. I redefine with hip hop. Praying that my tongue be blessed like Moses, leading my fan to the promised land. With this rhythmic form of speech, this is the last that I preach. Through all the man's triumph, tyranny's sure to meet him. Heed my words. Don't lose your freedom. Thank you. Good evening, and I also add my thanks to the CBC for holding this uh, third annual event, and I give you my solemn promise that I will neither sing nor dance. Uh, I'm going to um, read from a piece, and um, for those of us who have sort of reached an age, as I'll say, uh, there are pieces that we go back to time and time and time again because um, at a moment in our lives these pieces either changed the direction, created a path, or lighted a door for us to go through. And this is a piece that I was given by an uncle. Um, it was written in 1926 by Langston Hughes. It's called The Negro and the Racial Mountain. And this piece was written in response to a article in the Nation magazine uh, the week before this appeared. And that article was called uh, The Negro Art Hokum, an article by Charles Schuyler, uh, pardon me, by George Schuyler that argued there was no such thing as black or Negro art. One of the most promising of the young Negro poets said to me, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, meaning I believe I want to write like a white poet meaning subconsciously I would like to be a white poet, meaning behind that I would like to be white. And I was sorry the young man said that, for no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself. And I doubted then that with his desire to run away spiritually from his race, this boy would ever be a great poet. But this is the mountain standing in the way of any true Negro art in America this urge within the race toward whiteness, the desire to pour racial individuality into the mold of American standardization and to be as little Negro and as much American as possible. But let us look at the immediate background of this young poet. His family is of what I suppose one would call the Negro middle class, people who are by no means rich, yet never uncomfortable nor hungry smug, contented, respectable folk, members of the Baptist Church. The father goes to work every morning. He is a chief steward at a large white club. The mother sometimes does fancy sewings or supervises parties for the rich families of the town. 
The children go to a mixed school. In the home, they read white papers and magazines, and the mother often says, don't be like niggas when the children are bad. A frequent phrase from the father is, look how well a white man does things. And so the word white becomes unconsciously a symbol of all virtues. It holds for the children beauty, morality, and money. The whisper of, I want to be white, runs silently through their minds. This young poet's home is, I believe, a fairly typical home of the colored middle class. One sees immediately how difficult it would be for an artist born in such a home to interest himself in interpreting the beauty of his own people. He is never taught to see that beauty. He is taught rather not to see it, or if he, is, if he does, to be ashamed of it when it's not according to Caucasian patterns. But then there are the low-down folks, the so-called common element, and they are the majority. May the Lord be praised. The people who have their hip of gin on Saturday nights and are not too important to themselves or the community or too well fed or too learned to watch the lazy world go round. They live on 7th Street in Washington, D.C., or State Street in Chicago, and they do not particularly care whether they are like white folks or anybody else. Their joy runs bang into ecstasy. Their religion soars to a shout. Work may be a little today, rest a little tomorrow, play a while, sing a while, let's dance. These common people are not afraid of spirituals, as for a long time their more intellectual brethren were, and jazz is their child. They furnish a wealth of colorful, distinctive material for any artist because they still hold their own individuality in the face of American standardizations. And perhaps these common people will give to, world, to the world its truly great Negro artist, the one who is not afraid to be himself. Whereas the better class Negro would tell the artist what to do, the people at least let him alone when he does not appear. And they are, ashamed of, they are not ashamed of him if they know he exists at all. And they accept what beauty is their own without question. The road for the serious black artist who would produce a racial art is certainly rocky and the mountain is high. Until recently, he received almost no encouragement for his work from either white or colored people. The fine novels of Charles Chestnut go out of print with neither race noticing their passing. The quaint charm and humor of Dunbar's dialect verse brought to him in his day largely the same kind of encouragement one would give a sideshow freak. The present thing and vogue in things Negro, although it may do as much harm as good for the budding artist, has at least done this, that has brought him forcibly to the attention of his own people, among whom for so long, unless the other race had noticed him beforehand, he was a prophet with little honor. Most of my own poems are racial in theme and treatment, derived from the life I know. In many of them, I try to get, grasp and hold some of the meanings and rhythms of jazz. I am as sincere as I know how to be in these poems, and yet after every reading, I answer questions like these from my own people. Do you think Negroes should always write about Negroes? I wish you wouldn't read some of your poems, or I wish you wouldn't read some of your poems to white folks. How do you find anything interesting in a place like a cabaret? Why do you write about black people? You aren't black. What makes you do so many jazz poems? So I am ashamed for the black poet who says, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, as though his own racial world were not as interesting as any other world. I am ashamed, too, for the colored artist who runs from the painting of Negro faces to the painting of sunsets after the manner of the academicians because he fears the strange unwhiteness of his own features. An artist must be free to choose what he does, certainly, but he also must never be afraid to do what he must choose. I want to stop here because for the the artist that just read before me, the spoken word artist who spoke about the reception of hip hop. This is what Langston Hughes would say when people criticize hip hop. And this is the ending of this piece. 
Let the blare of Negro jazz bands and the bellowing voice of Bessie Smith singing the blues penetrate the closed ears of the colored near intellectuals until they listen and perhaps understand. Let Paul Robeson singing Water Boy and Rudolph Fisher writing about the streets of Harlem and Gene Toomer holding the heart of Georgia in his hands and Aaron Douglas's drawing strange black fantasies cause the smug Negro middle class to turn from their white, respectable, ordinary books and papers to catch a glimmer of their own beauty. We younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark skin selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. The Tom Tom cries and Tom Tom laughs. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on top of the mountain, free within ourselves. Thank you. And the wind chill is enough to hospitalize, so it's safe to say it's cold. But I'm afraid to put my hood up. See, for a while, being black was a conscious effort because my mom hated sagging in baggy clothes. So I would always wait until the bus left my house to pull on my older brother's shirt and lax the belt that was on my pants as if the clothes that I put on could chameleon me into acceptance. But half the time, it didn't even matter 